Good morning, Dr. DePersio. How are you? Good morning. How are you guys? Hi, Brad. Hi, John. Hi, John. How are you doing? Good. So, John, just let me know when we're ready to start. Yeah, I think we'll get started right about now, if that works for both of you. Be great. All right, let's kick things off. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents. It is my pleasure, as always, to welcome you back here with us. Um, I want to extend a special thank you to everybody who helped make last week's visit with the CDC director such a fantastic success. We had great engagement, a couple of fantastic talks, so thank you all. It was very exciting. Speaking of exciting, I can't wait for today's talk either. We'll hear more about Dr. Call, who I'm sure will be no stranger to most of you in just a moment. As a reminder, if you missed last week's talks or any of our past Grand Rounds talks, please head over to the Department of Medicine website and our YouTube channel to check them out. As always, I will help moderate the chat with our speaker at the end, time allowing, so please send in questions you have through the Q&A or chat functions as we go. I also want to thank you all for the feedback you provided at Grand Rounds so far. There'll be another opportunity to provide some with a QR code at the end, so if you can, scan that in addition to the credit, and please send us your thoughts on uh, talks we've had so far or any talks that you'd like to see in the future. With that being said, let's go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker. And to do so, we have the man who needs no introduction, the Chief of Division of Oncology, Dr. John DePerzio. Thank you so much. Okay, John, thank you. Um, well, um, this is the uh, uh, Jonathan Adams Jones uh, uh, Lectureship. And for the past 25 years, I've been introducing uh, established leaders in the field of hematologic malignancies, specifically relating to the treatment, diagnosis and treatment of lymphomas and Hodgkin's disease. And it's fitting that after a quarter of a century of this, I can finally introduce one of our own, Brad Call. Um, Brad is uh, a professor of medicine in the Division of Oncology, uh, and he's the clinical director of our lymphoma program. He's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, and uh, I think they, um, the cheese must have broken briefly while he left to go to medical school in Boston, but then was drawn back uh, to Cheeseville um, at the University of Wisconsin and did all of his training, internship, residency, and fellowship there, and stayed on as a faculty member and became really one of the nation's leaders in the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In 2015, we were really fortunate to be able to recruit Brad to Washington University, where he functions and serves as uh, head and director of the clinical lymphoma program here in the Division of Oncology. He's, uh, he's had too many um, uh, you know, uh, accolades to really review, but he's been, uh, been the editor-in-chief of a number of uh, lymphoma journals. He has um, been the PI and is the PI of a number of clinical trials and is really one of the go-to people uh, for uh, companies in the FDA for really uh, seeing how trials are regulated and uh, managed safely uh, and efficiently. He serves on many DSMBs. He's also been a, a real uh, consistent participant and leader in the ECOG, which is one of the national cooperative groups. Uh, relating to lymphoma trials. Um, he served as past chair of the Leukemia Research Foundation, uh, Mantle Cell Lymphoma Consortium. He's been on a number of NCI and NIH study sections and is an active member of the SPORE study section and is uh, a PI or co-PI of a number of NIH and NCI grants, including U10s, UO1s, and institutional trials as well. I would say that um, Brad um, nationally is known as an expert in mantle cell lymphoma. And I think today he's talking about one of his uh, other areas of real expertise and that's uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And the title of his talk today is the can uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the cancer that ki killed chemotherapy. Brad, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce you to this year's uh, uh, Jonathan Adams Jonas Lectureship. Well, thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Um, I trust you can see my slide. Oh, slides okay. Looks great. 
Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I, I, I picked um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia because this is um, internal medicine grand rounds and I wanted to pick a disease that is fairly common and seen in a lot of general medicine practices. So I thought this would be a good, um, a, a good disease to cover. So here are my disclosures. So let's just start with the basics. You know, what is chronic lymphocytic leukemia and why am I talking about it at the um, 2022 Jonas Lymphoma Lecture? Well, it's really an indolent lymphoproliferative disorder, which can present clinically as either a leukemia or a lymphoma. And actually the official WHO name for this entity is chronic lymphocytic leukemia slash small lymphocytic lymphoma or CLL, SLL. And if you just think about it in this standpoint of how you might talk to a patient, the, the recommendations are if your patient with this entity has um, the right uh, kind of cancer cells with the right immunophenotype and their circulating lymphocyte count is over 5,000, technically you should call the patient CLL. But if they have enlarged lymph nodes or splenomegaly, but the lymphocyte count is less than 5,000, you're supposed to call it SLL or small lymphocytic lymphoma. And unfortunately, it even gets a little more complicated because uh, the recommendation is if your patient has clonal B lymphocytes, but the count is less than 5,000, the name for this is monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis sort of analogous to monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance or MGUS. In my view, this has been made overly complicated having three names for really the same disease. And I can tell you, I have messed this up when talking to patients in clinic where one visit I say, well, your CLL looks good today. And then the next visit I say, well, your, S, your lymphoma uh, seems to be behaving today. And they say, wait, you're saying I have lymphoma? I thought I had leukemia. So it gets very confusing for patients. And now I really try to educate them on the nomenclature the first time we meet and talk about their diagnosis. Um, so let's think about where CLL, SLL fits into the whole spectrum of lymphoma. Um, this slide is kind of unreadable, but I just put it up for effect. This is the 2016 WHO update of mature B cell and T and NK cell neoplasms. And it's just meant to show you all the different types of lymphoma that we see in clinic. And you can see right at the very top in the mature B cell neoplasm category is this entity CLL, SLL. Um, so to use the term non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is actually fairly meaningless. It simply means it's not Hodgkin's, but it doesn't tell you anything more than that. And what really matters is the kind of lymphoma you're dealing with or the exact histologic subtype. So I'm just going to step back for a minute and let's think about, you know, why there are so many subtypes of lymphoma and where does CLL fit into that spectrum. So this is the way I like to think about it. Um, I, I think one of the reasons there's so many different kinds of lymphomas is, is, is it partly depends on what is the cell of origin for that lymphoma and then what molecular derangement occurred within that cell of origin. So this cartoon is just depicting you know, normal B cell development of healthy B cells. They're derived from hematopoietic stem cells. And then the cell is destined to become a B cell, but before it acquires a B cell receptor, it's called a pre-B cell. And if the cell turns malignant at this stage, the disease you get is acute lymphocytic leukemia or ALL. If you have an early B cell, a cell that hasn't trafficked through the germinal center of a lymph node yet, and that's the cell that turns malignant, you're likely to end up with either mantle cell lymphoma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Cells that have trafficked through the germinal center or are in the germinal center in their maturation and then turn malignant, you could end up with Burkitt lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, or diffuse large B cell lymphoma, depending upon the molecular derangement. Cells that exit the germinal center and are destined to become um, long-lived memory cells or plasma cells go through this intermediate stage of a plasmacytoid B cell. And if that cell turns malignant, the disease is Waldenstrom's. And if it's a plasma cell that turns malignant, then the disease is multiple myeloma. So CLL is back here, but you can kind of simplify lymphoma clinically. Um, and I think a 
pretty useful way to think of it is in two buckets. We have aggressive lymphomas and these diseases tend to have a short natural history, meaning the patients cannot live very long without treatment. These tend to be uh, diseases of rapid cellular proliferation and these are the diseases that are potentially curable with chemotherapy. And then we have the indolent lymphomas. These tend to be diseases with a long natural history. Patients can live for many years, even untreated. These tend to be uh, diseases of slow cellular accumulation. And we can generally think of these diseases as incurable with chemotherapy. So CLL fits here. And thinking about the incidence of um, CLL, um, this pie graph kind of shows the number of cases a year. So um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common lymphoma. We see almost 30,000 cases a year. PCN stands for plasma cell neoplasm. So this would be myeloma and related disorder, 25,000 cases a year. So here's CLL, SLL. It's not uncommon in the lymphoid malignancy world with about 20,000 cases a year. Here's follicular lymphoma, here's Hodgkin lymphoma, and some of the less common lymphomas here. So um, here's the incidence, which I just mentioned. The prevalence is much higher because the patients can live for a long time. So the, the patients accumulate in society and live with their disease. The median age uh, at diagnosis is right around 70 years. Um, it's more common in men than in women. And in this um, peripheral blood smear, we see what the cells look like under the microscope. They tend to be small, mature appearing lymphocytes. They don't look very much different than a normal healthy uh, B cell or T cell in the peripheral blood, uh, small amount of cytoplasm. Um, the, the chromatin is clumped, um, has this sort of chunky appearance. Um, if you were looking at a smear of AML or ALL, the blasts are much larger than this. The chromatin is very fine, sort of looks like tissue paper because the chromatin is open and very active. The cells are dividing like crazy. These cells are not doing that. And then you often see what are called smudge cells in the peripheral smear. The cells are kind of fragile. So literally when the tech you know, spreads the drop of blood out on the slide and makes the smear, some of these lymphocytes blow apart and you end up with what's called a smudge shell. And so we often see this in the peripheral smears of our CLL patients. So it's not a particularly difficult entity to diagnose. Uh, it can usually be identified by flow cytometry and there's a characteristic immunophenotype. The, they're, they're derived from B cells, so they should have a B cell receptor, which is going to have a heavy chain and a light chain, and the light chain is either kappa or lambda. So if you have a normal population of B cells, the distribution should be less than three to one in either direction of kappa or lambda. So if you do flow cytometry and the cells are you know 10 to 1 kappa or lambda, you have a clonal B cell proliferation just based on that. Um, they have the odd property of being CD5 positive, which is a really a T cell marker, but CD5 is universally expressed in CLL cells. They tend to be CD20 dim. CD20 obviously is the target for rituximab. Rituximab is a single agent, does not work very well in this disease. They tend to be CD23 bright, and so sometimes this entity can get, get confused with mantle cell lymphoma, which has CD5 positivity, but tends to be 20 bright and 23 negative, so that can be a differentiator. And you can make the diagnosis off the peripheral blood if the patient has circulating cells or from the marrow if the disease is in the marrow, or you can make it off lymph nodes from a lymph node biopsy. So a um, number of ways to establish the, the diagnosis here. So how do CLL patients come to medical attention? Well, easily the most common scenario is just an incidental finding of elevated white blood cells on a routine CBC, which was ordered for some other reason. And probably the majority of CLL patients we see in clinic, this was just the diagnosis was stumbled upon on routine blood work. But um, you do have patients who come to clinic with other scenarios. Sometimes patients present with pathologic lymphadenopathy, which can be massive in this disease. Sometimes they present with symptomatic splenomegaly and that can also be massive in this disease. They can present with fatigue due to worsening anemia. They can present with easy bruising and bleeding due to thrombocytopenia. Interestingly, the peripheral blood lymphocytosis 
virtually never causes clinical issues. And so this can be a fake out for clinicians. So this is kind of a pearl I'm giving you right now. The CLL cells are small. They're not sticky like the blasts in acute leukemia. So it's really uncommon to have leukostasis. I don't think I've ever seen it, to be honest, even if the white blood cell count is over 500,000. Here's a true story of a patient that came to my clinic a couple of years ago. He was actually transferred from an outside hospital to our BMT floor. He was 56 years old and he had presented to his primary care physician with several months of increasing fatigue. He was an avid cyclist and he was just noting a drop in his exercise capacity. And he also mentioned a little bit of mild abdominal discomfort. So his local doc did blood work and his white blood cell count was 644,000. The hemoglobin was 7.4 and the platelets were 123,000. His spleen was enlarged on exam. His oxygen saturations were 95% on room air. So he was satting just fine. You know, they understandably kind of panicked. They referred him here for urgent leukophoresis, which he absolutely did not need because the diagnosis turned out to be CLL and he just needed treatment treatment for his uh, CLL. So other uh, ways CLL can present, um, advanced CLL can lead to what I'll call marrow failure, which then results in anemia and or thrombocytopenia. Um, but the cytopenias are not always due to marrow failure. It can be a sequela of splenomegaly um, or a combination of the two. And then Patients with CLL are more prone to autoimmune cytopenias. Um, and so we see autoimmune hemolytic anemia or ITP or autoimmune neutropenia. And sometimes determining what is the mechanism of cytopenia isn't so straightforward, but um, the patterns can be helpful if they're extreme. And so I, I'm just giving you a couple of scenarios here. So scenario number one, I think would be like the most common scenario for CLL. Here's a patient with a very high white blood cell count, 280,000, hemoglobin 9.8, platelets 84,000. So they're anemic, they have thrombocytopenia, no splenomegaly on exam. And so this patient is likely having some degree of marrow failure due to heavy marrow involvement. And this can be demonstrated with the bone marrow evaluation, but it is amazing. Um, how much CLL has to be present before patients experience marrow failure. So here's an example from a patient I literally saw in clinic yesterday. Um, he's 56 years old. He's had CLL since 2015, and we've had him on observation. And we've just been watching the white blood cell count rise, and he's been getting borderline anemic and thrombocytopenic. Here's what his blood counts look like in November. But he would come to clinic and say, I really feel good. I feel really good. I don't want to do treatment right now. I'd say, okay, let's see you back in three months. So I saw him in February. He was coming off a COVID infection in January and he had recovered. Um, the, now the hemoglobin's 10.5 and the platelets are 88. So he's actually meeting criteria for treatment. And I'll show you those in a minute. I said, gosh, I think it's really time to get started. I convinced him to get a marrow. He didn't want to do it that day. So he came back a couple of weeks later. So we got a marrow in early March. And at the day of his marrow, the white count's 245,000. And now his hemoglobin's back up to 11.2 and the platelets are 110. So where he had met criteria for treatment, he suddenly doesn't necessarily meet the criteria now as hemoglobin and platelets have bounced back up a little bit. But look at his marrow findings. So in a 50-year-old man, you know, the marrow should be about 50% cellular, 50% fat. Well, his marrow is 90% cellular, so there's no fat. And of the cells, 90% of it is CLL. So it's almost completely replaced with CLL. But look at, he can still have pretty respectable hematopoiesis with a hemoglobin of 11 and platelets of 110, and he feels really good. So yesterday, he convinced me not to start treatment yet because he feels too good. So we sent him out and we said, we'll see you back in three months. Um, other scenarios, so here would be an example of a patient with a white blood cell count that's not that high, but some patients, the cells really like to accumulate in the spleen. So here's a patient with massive splenomegaly, spleen down to the umbilicus. And in this case, the cytopenias are probably just due to splenic sequestration, which can be an, you know, an indication for treatment. 
Scenario number three, here's a modest white count and a pretty good platelet count, but look at the hemoglobin. So when you see something like this, the anemia is you know, way out of proportion to the thrombocytopenia. So to me, this patient's either bleeding or they're hemolyzing and in CLL, it's more likely hemolysis. So you'd wanna do a hemolysis workup, a direct Coombs, maybe check for cold agglutinins, which are more common in CLL. And in the final scenario, again, here's a patient with a pretty good white blood cell count. It's not that bad, hemoglobin's not that bad, but look at the platelet count, 22,000. So platelets are really low, way out of proportion. This strongly suggests an immune mediated mechanism, ITP. There is no good test for ITP. If you're not sure, you can give you know, some IVIG as a test. If you see the platelet count shoot up, then you've, you've figured it out. Um, I, would, I'm so, I would be so convinced this patient has ITP, I would probably just start treatment with steroids plus minus rituximab to see if we could you know, normalize that platelet count. That's kind of a rule of thumb if your CLL patient doesn't meet normal criteria for treatment, but they get an autoimmune cytopenia, you take one crack at just treating it like ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia, because sometimes you can get that part of the disease to go into remission. And then if you can't get it under control with steroids or anti-CD20 therapy, then you would just go ahead and start CLL treatment. Other complications to um, to keep in mind in CLL, a big one is hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, it's quite common in CLL and CLL patients are very at risk for recurrent infections. It is the most common cause of death actually in CLL. And so there are some guidelines if your patient has an IgG level less than 500 and recurrent infections, it's appropriate to consider initiating IVIG replacement therapy or if the level is really low, even if they don't have the infections, just start it. And I see this a lot, and I have a, a lot of patients on IVIG replacement, and, and it really does make a difference. The, the rate and the severity of infections, at least in my experience, tends to diminish markedly once you start the patient on IVIG replacement therapy. And then another little thing to just keep in mind, a lot of these patients are more prone to skin cancers. Um, I don't know if I totally understand the mechanism. I assume it's related to some underlying T-cell dysfunction because we see this in patients after solid organ transplant and they're on T-cell immunosuppressive therapy. Some of these patients get just relentless skin cancers, basal cell and squames. And um, we can see this in some of our CLL patients. And so uh, you should have a low threshold for referral to dermatology and keep them plugged in with dermatology if you have a patient who starts to have that. So, um, okay, so let's say you, you um, inherit a new CLL patient and flow cytometry would establish the diagnosis. What would be the uh, uh, you know, most appropriate initial evaluation? Obviously we'll do blood counts and chemistries. The LDH and the beta-2 microglobulin are helpful prognostic markers. We'll establish the baseline uh, immunoglobulin levels. I say plus minus to SPEP. Some of these patients will actually make a paraprotein. And so I, if I see the total protein is elevated, um, I might do a serum protein electrophoresis to see if they're making a monoclonal IgM or IgA or IgG, sometimes they do. Um, we will do prognostic markers that'll help us figure out what the risk um, profile is for that individual patient. And I'll tell you more about this in a minute, but it's a CLL FISH panel that stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. It's looking at chromosomal rearrangements. We do something called IGHV mutation analysis. And nowadays we do a T53 mutation analysis, which requires sequencing. Um, what about imaging? I'd say it's not needed for most patients at diagnosis because most people come in with just an incidental finding, white blood cell count, not too bad. Um, if I find a lot of lymphadenopathy on physical examination, I might get a scan to really get a handle on what we're dealing with. Certainly if we're about to start treatment and I want a really accurate baseline of everything, I'd get a scan. If we're gonna start this drug called venetoclax, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, you need a, a scan to establish the tumor burden. If you are worried about something called Richter's transformation, which is transformation to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the, the best thing to get is a PET scan because you'll see very bright uptake in some of the nodes. Normally CLL, SLL is not very pet avid. You know, you'll have SUVs of three, four, five, six, but if you, you know, do a PET scan and someone's got an SUV of 30, 
there's a good chance they have a Richter's transformation and you'd want to biopsy that. And then the bone marrow, often not needed at diagnosis because you can make the diagnosis off the peripheral blood. But if you're about to start treatment, I often, you know, I'll get a marrow again just to get the most accurate baseline because we're going to want to look later to see how well our treatment is working. So there is a, a staging system for CLL in the United States. We use this thing called the Rye, named after um, Conti Rye. Um, and so if the patient just has lymphocytosis, they're considered stage zero. If you can find lymphadenopathy on physical exam, it's stage one. If you can palpate the spleen or liver, it's stage two. If they have a hemoglobin less than 11, uh, that's stage three. And if the platelet count is less than 100, it's stage four. And here are the outcomes for the different stages, although this is of historical interest only. These are not contemporary outcomes. This is what the outcomes were when the paper was published. All these outcomes are much better in 2022. Okay, so let's talk about prognostic factors for just a minute. I mentioned that we get a CLL fish panel. And so there's, there's several different findings one can find on the FISH panel. There's four different abnormalities that are tested for, with the most unfavorable being a 17P deletion. And this was a landmark paper in 2020 showing outcomes. You know, that was using treatments available at that time. But this is still true today, although all of these curves are going to be shifted to the right with better outcomes with modern, more modern treatments. But you can see 13Q deletion as the sole abnormality has the best prognosis in CLL. And then kind of intermediate prognosis would be no findings on the fish or what's called uh, trisomy 12Q. It's considered sort of neutral. And then 11Q minus, um, which is where the ATM gene sits as, as a moderate negative indicator. And then the, the very worst thing would be a 17P deletion. And analogous to that would be a P53 mutation. So if you 17P deleted or P53 mutated, you've got dysfunction of your P53 gene, which really makes chemotherapy ineffective in this disease and the prognosis becomes dramatically worse. So then the other thing we test is this thing called IGHV mutational status. So I'll try to explain this, this might be a little confusing. So you have to get back to thinking about the cell of origin, you know, before it becomes a CLL cell. So here's a CD5 positive B cell that's about to become a CLL cell. And the cell is a, you know, here's a cell that's about to traffic through the germinal center of a lymph node because it's encountered antigen. Well, if it's a CD5 positive B cell that has not gone through the germinal center, then we say the immunoglobulin heavy chain gene is unmutated because it has not undergone what we call somatic hypermutation. And so about half of the cases will be, will have this cell of origin, an unmutated B cell so what I'd said earlier that it's a pre-germinal center B cell was a little bit of an oversimplification because it turns out a proportion of CLL patients, their disease is derived from a B cell that has crept into the germinal center in response to antigen and, and undergone some degree of somatic hypermutation. And so if you can detect that, and so then we say the heavy chain gene has been mutated, which means it's undergone somatic hypermutation. So if the case is derived from a mutated, somatic hypermutated uh, B cell, then it's uh, IGVH mutated cell of origin. To try to explain this maybe a little better. So here's an immunoglobulin molecule. So this is the B cell receptor, picture this sitting on, on the surface of a B cell. This end is embedded in the cell membrane and the variable region is what's hanging out in space. And this is, which bind, this is what binds to antigen. This is how B cell recognizes antigen. And so here are the DNA sequences that lead to the um, protein product here. And so there's a light chain, which is either kappa or lambda. And then there's what's called the heavy chain. And then the light chain and the heavy chain have this segment that's called the variable region, which binds to antigen. And so you get all these DNA rearrangements and this is what gives you your, your antibody and your B cell diversity in your immune system. And then once the B cell is going through the germinal center of a lymph node, the variable region will literally mutate more in an effort to find the very best clones to respond to that antigen. And, and that's called somatic hypermutation. So that's what's happening in normal B cell development. So what we're really doing here 
is testing for somatic hypermutation and you'll compare the variability between the um, immunoglobulin heavy chain gene in the clonal CLL population and then you'll compare it to a homologous germline and if the um, sequence variability is less than 2%, we say the cells are unmutated. And this then is a higher risk version of CLL. If um, the sequence variability is 2% or more, that's evidence it's gotten into the germinal center. And this turns out to be lower risk disease. So we test this now in everybody uh, around the time of diagnosis. In the older days, we had surrogates for this CD38 and ZAP70, but now we can just do the actual test. So there's really no reason to do the surrogate tests anymore. So once you have all that done, you can um, you know, estimate risk for your patient. And so here's something called the CLL uh, International Prognostic Index, and it's a point system. And so patients get a point for age, for stage, two points for an elevated beta-2 microglobulin, two points for being unmutated, and then four points if your deletion 17P or P53 mutated, and then four different risk categories can be derived with these five-year outcomes. You can see very good outcomes for low risk and intermediate outcomes, but then look at what high risk has a much, very much inferior five-year overall survival. But the only way you can get to high risk, which takes seven points, you have to have um, 17P or P53 mutated. You could have everything else and not that, and the highest score you could have is six. So it just shows you the impact of 17P deletion or P53 mutation. Fortunately, this is only present in five to 10% of patients at the time of diagnosis, but these abnormalities tend to accumulate as the disease advances, and so you find it more commonly in second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line. So you have to keep retesting your patients because they can acquire P53 mutations or 17P deletions later in the disease course. Okay, so let's talk about management. Um, so it turns out about a third of CLL patients never need treatment. Um, they will die of old age with their CLL having never needed treatment for their CLL. Um, about a third of patients will need treatment around the time of their diagnosis or near the time of diagnosis. And then about a third of patients do not need treatment immediately, but will progress to treatment two, three, four, five, six, seven years later. So, you know, most patients eventually require some kind of CLL treatment in their lifetime. So why not just treat everybody? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, indolent lymphomas are generally considered incurable, so we don't feel confident we can cure people. Prior studies of chemotherapy versus observation in early stage indolent lymphoma have shown no overall survival benefit for this early initiation of treatment. So there really was an advantage, was not an advantage to early treatment. And then as I just mentioned, you know, a reasonable proportion of patients prove they never need treatment. So you would be subjecting a third of patients to some kind of unnecessary toxicity when they never would have required it. But, you know, an active question in the field is, you know, what if you encounter a patient now who does not have clinical indications for treatment, but they have bad biology? You know, maybe they have unmutated IGHV disease or very bad biology like 17P deletion. Well, still the current recommendation is to observe these patients until they meet clinical criteria and some of these patients will go years before they need treatment, but this is an area of, um, of active study. There are studies looking at early intervention with new targeted agents in these biologically high-risk groups. So those studies are ongoing. We just don't have any answers yet. Okay, so when do you treat CLL? Well, certainly if a patient has symptoms, then you should treat them if they've got, you know, night sweats or unexplained weight loss or painful adenopathy or splenomegaly, it's time to treat. Fatigue is tricky. A lot of patients say I'm fatigued and yeah, sometimes it's from the CLL, but sometimes there's some other explanation. So if they just say they're fatigued, you got to look for other things and you got to be a little bit confident that it's from the CLL. And this can be a real difficult situation to sort out. And 
occasionally you just can't find any other explanation. And so we'll start treating for CLL and see if the fatigue improves. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, which means you, you guessed wrong. Um, cytopenias are um, considered an indication for treatment in the guidelines, say if the platelets drop below 100,000, if the hemoglobin drops below 11, or if a patient has refractory autoimmune complications. And then bulky disease can be an indication for treatment. So very large lymph nodes, you know, 10 centimeters or symptomatic splenomegaly. And then sometimes we'll treat just if the white blood cell count is just increasing like crazy. Um, I saw a patient in clinic on Monday whose white blood cell count went from 150,000 to 300,000 in three months. Um, still is not anemic or thrombocytopenic, but is close and you can see the writing on the wall. Um, you know, so you might as well get started before the patient's in trouble. So sometimes you'll do it for a really rapidly wise, rising white blood cell count. So let's talk about the types of treatment we administer in CLL, and we'll talk about chemotherapy for a minute, and then I'll pivot to the new targeted agents. And so, you know, here's what we've had historically in CLL for many, many years. Alkylating agents were the mainstay of treatment, and it was chlorambucil or cyclophosphamide. And then in the 1980s, purine nucleoside analogs came along, fludarabine and pentastatin, and these agents proved to be uniquely active in CLL. And then in the 90s, a lot of combination studies were done, and they showed like a combination of fludarabine cyclophosphamide was more active than, say, fludarabine alone, and that became the standard. And then rituximab came along in the late 90s and right around 2000. And so even though rituximab has minimal single agent activity in CLL. It turned out when you combine it with chemotherapy, it made it work better. So fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab was proven to be better than FC in phase three clinical trials. And so that became a standard. And then around 2010, the chemotherapy drug bendamustine was introduced, which turned out to be a pretty good option in CLL. Um, FCR is not for everybody. And so BR is not quite as effective as FCR, but it's better tolerated and it turned out to be a good option for some of our patients. So here was kind of a simplistic approach that I was using for several years. If I had a really young, healthy, fit patient, we would try FCR. Most of your CLL patients would be in this age range between 60 and 80. FCR would be too toxic for most of those patients. So I would use bendamustine rituximab. If you had a really frail patient, I might use a chlorambucil-based regimen, and there was a study that showed if you combine it with a newer anti-CD20 called obinutuzumab, that was even better. So this was a very simple standard approach that we were using for, for several years in CLL. So what kind of outcomes could one expect? Well, FCR, if you just look at outcomes, you know, in 100 unselected patients, it would get you a median progression-free survival in the four to five-year range, but significant myelosuppression, significant immunosuppression, and a not trivial risk for therapy-related MDS and AML. So it's kind of a high-risk, high-reward strategy, um, but it has been a standard for young patients for many years. Um, BR therapy, not quite as potent, median progression-free survival around three years, more modest myelosuppression, modest immunosuppression, a little bit lower risk, I think, for MDS and AML. And then if you really dilute it, water it down, give something like chlorambucil, obinutuzumab, it on average would get you like two years of progression-free survival, but is very well tolerated. So it could be a good option for a, a very frail patient who needs treatment. So this was a really interesting analysis. So just, you know, looking at FCR a little more closely, you know, MD Anderson was one of the pioneers of the FCR regimen. They'd administered it for years and years and years and published a lot on it. So they went back a few years ago and looked, what if we segregated outcomes based on IGHV mutated, which is the favorable group versus unmutated, which is the unfavorable group. And this was an amazing discovery, which has now been replicated by other groups. So here you see the unmutated patients and they get that average result with FCR. Most patients have relapsed eventually, but look if the patients were IGHV mutated 
with no Dell 17P or no deletion 11Q, so nothing unfavorable, 60% of patients are still holding their remission after 10 years. Remember, I told you a few minutes ago, we've always thought of this disease as incurable, but here you have a proportion of the favorable patients holding remission 10 years after treatment, just six months of treatment, which sort of begs the question, is there a proportion of patients that are being cured? Maybe, it's hard to know because the disease has such a unique and long natural history, and we certainly can see patients relapse after 10 years and 15 years, but it does raise the question about whether the disease actually is curable if they have all of these favorable attributes at diagnosis. So it does create a bit of a dilemma for the FCR regimen. You know, what do you do nowadays if you have a young CLL patient? Let's say they're mutated, no 17P, no 11Q. You can give them six months of FCR. As I just mentioned, six out of 10 patients will be in remission 10 years later. You do have these risks though, and I've seen all these bad things happen to people. I had a patient who got FCR at an outside hospital. She was red cell transfusion dependent for two years because of prolonged marrow failure myelosuppression. Um, seen, you know, we, be, we, we become amateur ID doctors in hematology because of all the opportunistic infections. And then you know, there's the AML MDS risk. Another true story from my clinic, Here's a very nice guy that I treated a few years ago, 54 year old man. We treated him in 2018. He had everything favorable, mutated 13Q deletion. I treated him with FCR. It went poorly, terrible cytopenias, infections up the wazoo. Um, I stopped after four cycles because it was such a struggle for him. And then he goes into complete remission, 2020, I see the platelet count starting to drop. So I did a marrow. He now has therapy induced MDS with the 7Q minus deletion proving it's therapy related. He had to get an aloe transplant last year and he's now has you know, lots of complications from that with bad quality of life. So um, it's a very hard decision because you can get a great outcome and you can get these outcomes that you know, really make you regret what you did. So this is, there's a lot of debate in the CLL community right now around the role for FCR in these young favorable risk patients. So let's shift now and finish up the talk. Um, you know, <laughs> why, why is this the cancer that has killed chemotherapy? So we have all of these new targeted agents that are looking, you know, incredibly promising. Um, you know, the idea behind targeted agents, you know, is that a lot of cancer cells have some survival pathway that um, they're dependent on for growth or survival. And if you can target that pathway with the right kinase inhibitor or some other small molecule inhibitor, maybe you can kill those cancer cells. And in CLL, it turns out there are two very good targets. There's the B cell uh, receptor signaling pathway, um, and then there's the BCL2 pathway. So let's, let's just look at those for a sec. So this is just sort of an oversimplified version of the B cell receptor pathway. Um, so here's the, the B cell receptor that binds antigen and after signaling, there's a whole cascade of downstream signaling that will eventually lead to some sort of signal to the nucleus and transcriptional activation. And, and the signaling can go through these different kinases, one called SICK, one called PI3 kinase, one called Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And we were at an ASH meeting about 15 years ago and we saw a plenary session showing this new drug, this pill called fostamatinib, and there were responses in lymphomas just giving patients this pill, which targeted sick, and that was a clue that maybe targeting this B cell receptor pathway could be a way to attack B cell malignancies. And it wasn't long after that, I got a call from a friend of mine at another institution. He's like, Brad, you've got to jump on this phase one study we're doing with this drug called Cal 101 it really works uh, in B-cell diseases and it targets PI3 kinase. And so this was when I was at the University of Wisconsin, we jumped on quickly this, this oral agent called Cal-101, which inhibits this enzyme called PI3 kinase. And it has these different isoforms and this drug hits the Delta isoform, which is the most important isoform in B-cells. And so we finished the phase one with a phase two expansion. And these are waterfall plots showing improvement in lymph node size and you know look at how well this drug was working in CLL and I saw it with my own eyes 
patients with completely refractory disease. And I, I just thought this was maybe the best drug I had seen since rituximab. It was looking so good and really excited about this agent. So this drug eventually was picked up by a bigger company and now goes by the name Idelalisib, and it has FDA approval in a variety of settings. But as we got more experience with this drug, we started to learn about some concerning toxicity signals like transaminitis, colitis, pneumonitis. And when the drug was tested in frontline, all of these things actually got worse. So the drug seems to cause some sort of T cell mediated um, inflammation. When the colitis patients would get biopsied, you'd see these dense T cell infiltrates. So it turned out to be a drug that was had good activity, but also had fairly significant risks and patients really needed to be monitored closely. So anyway, now there's a whole class of PI3 kinase inhibitors that have been approved in these diseases, but they've been largely relegated to the relapse setting because other better drugs have come along. Uh, this was the first better drug to come along, it used to be called PCI32765, now it goes by the name ibrutinib. This is a, a kinase inhibitor that hits an enzyme called Bruton's tyrosine kinase or BTK. It's an oral agent that hits right here. And um, we started working with this drug about 10 years ago and it was obvious it was every bit as good if not better than hitting PI3 kinase. And I remember when I saw these curves for the first time, this is from a phase one, two study in CLL. The blue is in treatment naive patients and the red is in the relapsed refractory patients. So over 80% of patients were responding. And these are patients that had failed chemotherapy. And look at how durable these responses are looking. So it became obvious very quickly that this drug was a, a game changer in CLL and very quickly um, this drug was moved into the frontline setting to be tested. And this led to this landmark paper um, published in 2015. You can see Dr. Bartlett was a co-author on this paper looking at a brutinib for the initial management of patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Now the comparator in this trial was chlorambucil. Um, and so kind of weak competition, but it beat it handily. Um, and you can see these really good outcomes just taking, you know, basically one pill a day. So um, abrutinib was quickly approved as a frontline agent in CLL. And then with more um, investigation, we learned that it can overcome some of the unfavorable biology. So the drug works just, did, just as well in the unmutated patients compared to the IGVH mutated patients, which was a great discovery. Um, and so suddenly the drug's looking very attractive then the U.S. cooperative groups said, well, okay, well, you can beat chlorambucil, which, you know, just about any drug can beat that, but can you beat stiffer competition? So the alliance group, which we're a part of, um, compared abrutinib head-to-head -head against a better control arm, bendamustine rituximab, and again, abrutinib was better. Adding rituximab did not make the abrutinib any better. And then the ECOG group compared um, abrutinib uh, against the FCR regimen. So the very best immunochemotherapy regimen that we had. So you can see the control arm is performing much better at three years than chlorambucil or even BR. But look at this, abrutinib is still better. So here is you know targeted therapy defeating the very best immunochemotherapy head to head. So we had this first generation BTK inhibitor, abrutinib, which has been FDA approved now for several years. It has these very high response rates. We have, you know, seven, eight, nine year follow-up right now and 75% of patients are still in remission at five years. It does have a lot of nagging side effects. However, there are some off-target kinase effects including hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And so there have been the development of what are called second generation BTK inhibitors and they have been compared head to head now against abrutinib. So here's an example, acalabrutinib. It's just as effective as the brutinib, but it, it has less side effects. And so that's sort of become my go-to B, uh, BTK inhibitor in CLL because it's just an easier drug to administer than a brutinib with less side effects. I mentioned the lymphocytosis. Um, so here's another case from my clinic. This is, can be an amazing finding. This is a 55-year-old gentleman that I had been watching for a number of years, and this is what her counsel, his counselor like at diagnosis. And I saw him in the summertime, 
and his white count had crept up to 60,000. Hemoglobin was still good, platelets not bad, but he came to clinic and suddenly his neutrophil count was 200. It had been 3,000 six months prior. So I suspected he had autoimmune neutropenia given the pattern. And I spent a month trying to get his neutrophil count up with steroids and GCSF, which did not work at all. Um, I didn't wanna give him rituximab due to the COVID risks at the time. So I said, okay, let's just start treating your CLL. So we started him on treatment with the Brutinib on August 30th. And then I, a month later, look at his neutrophil count is completely corrected. Platelets are way better. So you know the drug is working, but look at the lymphocytosis. So these patients get um, immediate shrinkage of their lymph nodes and their spleen and all these malignant cells redistribute to the peripheral blood. So the white count shoots up and it can fake you out into thinking the disease is progressing, but it's not. It's just a lymphocyte redistribution. And even in January, he still had 358,000 circulating lymphocytes. But look at the hemoglobins up, you know, 12. The platelets are up to 186,000, and the ANC is 2,100. So these cells are not a clinical problem, and he has good hematopoiesis. So we can live with the lymphocytosis, and they do tend to die off over time. And then I'll just kind of finish up by talking about the, the last really promising targeted agent that um, has changed the landscape um, in CLL, and that is targeting BCL2 with what are called BH3 mimetics. BCL2 is a protein that gets overexpressed in a lot of lymphomas, and it sends a, a don't die signal to the cells. And there are agents now that can knock down the level of BCL2 inside the cells. And if you can knock it down far enough, the cells are willing to die. So there's this drug called ABT199 or venetoclax. And I was lucky enough to participate in the phase one studies with venetoclax. And here's another amazing anecdote from my clinic. This was a 68 year old gentleman with small lymphocytic lymphoma or the lymphoma version of CLL. He had incredibly bulky disease. He had failed all of these prior therapies. He was completely chemotherapy refractory. He was in terrible pain from massive lymphadenopathy in the abdomen. And I got him on the phase one study of venetoclax. He got 150 milligrams daily. And look at what happened, you know, a month later, how much lymph node reduction there was. And this is how his scan looked basically a year after starting treatment. Just amazing response for a novel targeted agent in a chemotherapy refractory situation. So here's the waterfall plots from the phase one study. The drug clearly worked. This drug was quickly moved to frontline and the German CLL study group then combined it with the anti-CD20 obinutuzumab. And this drug is so effective that they developed it as a time limited option. So you take this venetoclax obinutuzumab for 12 months and then stop. And they compared it against chlorambucil obinutuzumab. But again, big curve separation and this positive trial led to the FDA approval of venetoclax obinutuzumab in the front line for CLL. So this agent, again, quickly moved to a frontline option. This drug is very well tolerated. Patients do very well on it. A really interesting risk is this risk for tumor lysis syndrome. The drug is so potent in CLL that you have to do this really cautious ramp up of the drug. So it's 20 milligrams for a week, and then 50 milligrams for a week, and then 100 milligrams for a week, and then 200, and then you get up to 400, and you have to do a risk assessment of your patients based upon their tumor burden, and if patients have high-risk disease based on a big lymph nodes um, or a moderate-sized lymph nodes and a high lymphocyte count, you have to actually admit them to the hospital for tumor lysis monitoring during week one and week two, just for two, two days each week. So a little bit of a hassle factor, but once you get through that, the drug is, is incredibly easy to administer. So we have all these new options for first-line CLL. We have BTK inhibitors, abrutinib and acalabrutinib, and I think there'll be another one approved this later this year called xanabrutinib. Xanabrutinib beat bendamustine rituximab head-to-head. -head. That was just shown at a recent national meeting. So I think we'll have another second generation BTK inhibitor. And now we have venetoclax, which was approved in 2019. 
Usually venetoclax is combined with obinutuzumab and that's given for a year. The BTK inhibitors are usually given as single agents and they're given indefinitely. There's no stop date for those. So here's what the menu looks like nowadays in CLL. You know, we still have the old stuff, FCR, BR, but we have all these new agents. And so then you have to think about what's the most appropriate setting. And so, you know, just to kind of summarize, Chemotherapy does not work well at all if we have P53 mutations. So we go to novel agents and it turns out that um, probably indefinite BTK inhibitor is the way to go here. If you have IGHV unmutated disease, uh, chemotherapy is far less effective compared to mutated disease. So we usually go with novel agents. And then if you have IGHV mutated disease, that's the most favorable, favorable situation. Everything works great. All of these things work great here. So you can talk to your patients about time-limited chemotherapy. It's just six months, but you can also now do time-limited venetoclax, 12 months, or you can do indefinite abrutinib or acalabrutinib. So it's these complicated discussions with patients about the pros and the cons uh, of the different options. So there's my current strategy. I'm gonna skip ahead because I just wanna finish up and leave just a couple minutes for questions. One slide on COVID. COVID's hit the CLL population pretty hard. An early study showed um, the infections tend to be more severe. Um, the case fatality rate was 35% early in the pandemic. It's improved, you know, if, if we've gotten better at managing COVID. We've also learned that CLL patients do not respond well to vaccination, to two-dose mRNA vaccination. If you're treatment naive, only it's a 50-50 proposition whether you respond. And if you're on active therapy, very unlikely to respond and almost no chance if you've got an anti-CD20 in the last 12 months. A study just came out a couple of weeks ago saying the third dose will seroconvert an additional 25%. So again, vaccination, very difficult in this population and Evisheld is getting very heavy use in our patients right now. So I think I'm gonna skip ahead um, because we're really at the end um, and just summarize, um, hopefully, I was able to teach a little bit about CLL today, this lymphoproliferative disorder and its characteristics and the risk categories, very high risk disease, high risk is, mute, is unmutated and standard risk is mutated. Immunochemotherapy is effective, but it's been largely replaced now by novel targeted agents. And we have the BTK inhibitors and the BCL2 inhibitors, which are incredibly effective. There's a lot of studies now trying to evaluate time limited therapies, you know, can we get away so we don't have to give these patients BTK inhibitors forever? So for example, we just saw a study presented at a meeting which did venetoclax abrutinib for 12 months and then stopped. And we have studies that are using MRD assessments to figure out rational stopping points for treatment. So that's really what a lot of the trials are working on right now is trying to get away from indefinite therapy so patients can take therapy breaks and then finally, COVID has created major challenges for CLL patients and their providers, but things are definitely looking up with Evisheld and its availability. So with that, I'll stop. And um, I know we just have a couple minutes left and happy to take any questions. Dr. Call, thank you so much for your talk today. We really appreciate it. Let me share my screen here while we um, go ahead and answer, uh, ask a few of these questions for you. Uh, one coming in here from the chat asks, uh, hepatic sinusoidal infiltration is common in CLL, but hepatobiliary damage is rare. Is there anything known about what causes hepatobiliary damage? Now, that's this entity called banishing bile duct syndrome, which we think is a perineoplastic syndrome. We see it more in Hodgkin's. I have a CLL patient right now who has it, but it's very rare. But we don't, we just think it's a perineoplastic syndrome, but we don't totally understand the mechanism. Fair enough. Uh, Dr. Auberly, one of my co-chiefs, asks, how often do you monitor the IgG levels in these patients after their initial diagnosis, or do you only recheck if they develop recurrent infections? Well, check it at diagnosis, and then um, I might check it like once a year in people. They tend to not change all that much, but once you move on to treatment, you'd think treatment would make the IG IgG levels get better, but they, they often don't get better, and it can, treatment can actually make things worse. Fair enough. You know, I, I was interested in one of your early slides when you were going through the very 
disparate phenotypes in your patients, some that are very anemic predominant, some that are very thrombocytopenic, very splenomegaly versus, you know, marrow involvement. Is, is there an underlying variation in the CLL that we just don't maybe fully understand yet that contributes to that, that type of phenotype? Yeah, I think this is a bit of a guess on my part, but I'm assuming different cases have different, um, you know, uh, integrins and um, cell surface molecules that give the cells a tropism for the spleen or the a tropism for lymph nodes, and other patients don't have that, so the disease just stays in the blood. Um, but I, I don't have a you know a, a perfect scientific explanation for these observations. Great. Uh, Brad, I, I have one question. Um, yeah. you know, we're right at the end here, so maybe I could ask the last question, John. So the 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 use of immunotherapies such as CAR Ts are less effective in CLL than in diffuse large cell lymphoma. So, what do we know about the mechanism of that, and what do we know about those patients? Because there's been a lot of patients that have been treated for Richter's transformation yeah. with um, with CAR Ts. Is it the same? In other words, does a large cell component go away at the same rate and you're still stuck with a CLL most of the time? Or does is there a different uh, or complete response rate for the CLL background in those patients? Yeah, with regard to Richter's, sometimes you can get the Richter's clone to go away, <clears throat> but you're still stuck with the underlying CLL population, it seems. Um, John, you probably know more about the CAR-T story than I do, to be honest. Um, you know, there is some efficacy for CAR-T in CLL, but it doesn't appear quite as good. And I'm not exactly sure why, you know, maybe it's just poor T cell health in these CLL patients. They, a lot of times by the time they get to CAR-T, they have had the disease for many, many years and they've had a lot of prior therapies. Maybe it would work better earlier in the disease course. I'm still hopeful that CAR-T will find a home in CLL in the future. And I think it will, but as you can see, the pills work so well in CLL that, that the bar is going to be a bit higher for CAR T to find a, a therapeutic niche in CLL. I have one last question, just as yeah. something that comes up all the time, Brad. Uh, patients on abrutinib or acalabrutinib start to progress. Um, what do you do with the abrutinib when you're adding uh, venetoclax? Uh, Stay, you know. Yeah, I didn't get into all this wonky stuff. Yeah. So um, sometimes when patients start to progress through their BTK inhibitor, if you take the BTK inhibitor away, the progression can be just dramatic. And so we've sort of learned the hard way now. I keep the BTK inhibitor on during the venetoclax ramp up. And then when I get to full dose venetoclax, I will typically pull the BTK inhibitor off. Thanks. Thank yeah. So John, I think that's it. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you again so much for both of you joining us here today for sharing your expertise and for this lecture. We really appreciate it. Um, once again, uh, if anyone has any feedback, please send it along. QR codes are available and we'll hope to see you next week. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Brad.